You chose to go to some brutal conditions. Rowing from Tromso to Svalbard, I don't think is everyone's summer holiday. But probably not the best person to jump on a rowing boat and row for like 16 days sat down. You row about 12 hours a day, so you do 12 gym workouts a day. Yeah. So 6,000 odd calories a day burnt. Knowing what you know about the ocean, how did you put the risk of getting involved in this? This isn't a row that just two weeks before you jump on the boat and you go. There's so much planning that goes into it. Is there any moments where you were genuinely quite scared. We're getting told that there's storms of up to 40 nautical miles coming on, which is bringing sea states of eight meters. You know, you're on a roller coaster. You get thrown around in your cabin. I would have been happy to not be on the boat that day. It turned completely on end when a whale like comes up next to the boat, right? One day we're there so tired. And uh, like that day, we have probably seen about 40 whale breaches. It was insane. This row, we believe there's only 11 people who have done this. It was very fulfilling to complete it. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Inner Fight Podcast. Today I am diving into the quite fascinating world of ocean rowing with a good friend, member here at Inner Fight, Andy Saville. Andy is a, I guess what you would call a seasoned ocean man. He's worked in this space and been in this space for a number of years and has quite an incredible and, as you'll see in the show or hear in the show, infectious passion for the ocean. Actually makes it sound a little bit less scary than I ever really thought it was. He talks to us today about a grueling 16-day rowing challenge that he completed recently, taking on some pretty brutal conditions. Sat in, for some days, inside a small cabin whilst a storm blew over. Been told at times that if he continues on his expedition, his chances of getting rescued if things went wrong are probably not super high. Coupled with that, the fact that he has a beautiful wife and two girls at home. He talks us through how it felt leaving them at the airport, all the way to the feeling of when they actually made it back to shore. This is episode number 947 of the Inner Fight Podcast. No matter where you are in the world, thanks a lot for tuning in. Let's jump into today's show. Andy, you just said it there, you chose to be there. Why on earth, or let's say it like this way, most people go on a nice summer holiday with their family <laughs> and their children. You chose to go to some brutal conditions. How, why, mate? Tell us. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, obviously rowing, uh, rowing from Tromso to Svalbard. I don't think is everyone's summer holiday. Um, but yeah, from... Uh, for, for an experience, something to do. I kept on thinking that uh, that gift for my future self, you know, when I'm 70, if I had said no yeah. and I didn't get on the boat, I would probably always regret that decision. So unfortunately for me, being a family man, you know the, you know the family well. I had to leave the wife and kids. It was pretty much a month uh, away from them, you know, uh, and 16 days of actually rowing on the, on the water itself. And the other days were preparing the boat to launch and preparing the boat for shipping after we had done the row. So, yeah. yeah. I always wonder, because a lot of... I've had a few people on the show that have rowed before Atlantic Crossing, Indian Ocean Crossing, and they all come around in, a, in different ways. So how did you get into this, mate? So, I mean, my background has always been the sea. Like, since I was a kid, right? I catch you on the beach quite regularly whenever I yeah. go surfing. You're always in your, yeah. in your Speedos going for a swim. So, like, for me, the sea is very much, you know, it's my, it's my workplace. I work in the marina. Um, I've been sailing my whole life. I surf, you know, scuba dive. So, the sea for me is, like, my, my kind of place. So, I met, uh, actually, I end up with this one because I'd met Toby while he was setting up for his Atlantic crossing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, helped him navigate the marine industry up to, you know, pretty much the start line and when he had finished that race helping get the boat back here and and just helping him pretty much get whole set up and uh and yeah 
the, the industry here is not the easiest to navigate. So trying to get him where he needed to be, um, yeah, really helped him get across that one. So I think after that, it was a way of him saying thank you. And Toby's not your normal guy. He's not your normal guy. You'll say, let's go to the pub, I'll buy you some dinner and whatever. Yeah. He's that sort of guy who's like, okay, let's let's go for a long row together. That's his way of saying thank you. It's pretty incredible. Isn't yeah. It? You, you help a guy to row across the Atlantic and you prepare the logistics, as you say. And his way of saying thank you is like a gift of, another month on the yeah, boat oh, there you, you go <laughs> Let, let's go row so yeah I mean it, it started it was uh, a discussion of where we could row we looked at a few different options and then this one was was very prominent this was one that it kind of ticks lots of boxes um, it was actually on the tail end of Toby rowing the Atlantic that when he was out there he was pretty frustrated by the amount of plastics and stuff that he came across so while he was out there he created the plastic pledge which is now getting rolled out in the schools and, wow. and so on and it's a bit of um, it kind of goes in line with the Inspire One Million program that we're all on this journey now together, meeting students and trying to make them really aware of plastic pollution. So yeah, so this this row, it was it was an interesting one going up there because anything that happens up in the Arctic, it, we feel it down here. You know, it's such a that and the Antarctica, they they control the weather yeah. the weather patterns in the Atlantic, the colder currents, the warmer currents, and everything. So yeah, going up there and and seeing what was happening up there and seeing what plastic was up there. and What's it you know, like? I, it, you know, it started off, it was actually, it was, it was too warm the first couple of days. Like we actually felt, I even nicknamed an air of the boat Marbella, where I, where I would sit, <laughs> pull my buff up over my, my uh, like baseball cap and just sit there and have the sun baking down on me. And it was so, it was so warm. We're getting sunburnt. Toby had this little, it was probably a, toothpaste size sun cream he had used that up within about two days so we're almost like rationing out the sun cream that we had um and that was yeah i mean that then first few days it was the area of sea that we were most worried about so the the devil's dance floor the barren sea and this Mm. area it was broken down into different legs and that was when we were basically in the middle of nowhere like 100 odd nautical miles away from any land any security rescue we didn't have support boats nothing we're just out there by ourselves the three of us uh obviously just rowing away and that first stage was it was actually turned out to be kind of the nicest bit of the trip the warmest you know it was after we got to bear island which is kind of halfway point if you like that we're greeted by the strongest currents any of us had ever felt uh fog which was like freezing cold like cutting through you so cold and uh and we actually met we came encounter with the fog i was on the shift by myself so i was rowing at night you do like one up on the oars instead of two right. and throughout the day you try and do two hours on one hour off and in the night time you change it you have one person rowing and you overlap it so hopefully you can get like a four hour lie down right. you know so each person gets about four hour shift one of you gets the the kind of tail end of it unfortunately but yeah, I was rowing by myself and literally hit this fog and I'd never felt like cold like it because you're, you're already tired, you're drained. Yeah. And it was cutting through everything, going through your shoes, your, your toes are freezing instantly. And Orla gets up and uh, yeah, she joins me on the rest of that. We got hit by some currents. So we were both us rowing. I think I'd already rowed for about two hours with Orla and realized we hadn't actually moved, you know. So that area of the journey is where it all changed. Yeah. You know, we end up knocking up, Toby, come on, and all three of us on the oars. So I probably rowed probably about four hours straight that oh. evening trying to get out of the currents. Um, and that's when it all changed. That's when we end up hitting all these storms, you know, four times we were on sea anchor. Oh. So. Well, people that I've spoken to, it, it's weird rowing, isn't it? Because it's not always ocean men or men that know a lot about the ocean, like, like yourself, Andy, that get into it. It's more stupid endurance athletes or just <laughs> crazy people it is like that yeah from from the start so i think a lot of the dangers or the way that the sea operates is not at the forefront of their mind they know it can be dangerous but you've been involved in the ocean for a number of years you know all about weather fronts you know exactly how the ocean or a lot better how the ocean behaves yeah, than, yeah. than a, lot, a lot of us so you've got a lot of knowledge of the risk of going on a carbon fiber rowing boat bathtub <laughs> a bathtub <laughs> a bathtub with oars literally yeah. Yeah. with yeah and and hundreds of miles from anywhere yeah how do you put that risk factor together 
in your mind, especially as you said, you, you have a family, you have a yeah, young yeah. family. Knowing what you know about the ocean, how did you put the risk of getting involved in this together? So th there was a saying that we used throughout the row, which was like, the only decision we have to make is the one that keeps us safe, right? So we kind of always had that in mind throughout the whole thing. And uh, any situation we got in, we had to all agree that the decision that we're going to make is going to be the right one. So obviously, before you even go on an expedition like this, um, there's so much planning that goes into it. So this isn't a row that just two weeks before you jump on the boat, you jump on it and you go. Um, Orla actually did that on her first row. She didn't. She just turned up and literally three or four days before she rode from Sausalito to Hawaii, she was in the shop buying clothes for the trip because she didn't really know yeah, what she signed up for. And uh, there's me, obviously, you know, assisting with Toby. Toby had done the, the row before because it's his boat. He's also got a lot of the kit. So every risk, you try and mitigate as much as you can and you yeah. try to have backups for your backups. So, for example, water. You know, we take it for granted. You know, even just filling up my water bottle in the gym now, yeah. I can just fill up my water bottle and not worry about it. Out on the sea, like we're making water from the seawater itself by desalination. In order to do that, we need to make sure we have power. We get power from the sunlight and we have to charge our batteries. So everything is calculated. So in order to make sure if you're out of power and you can't use your water maker, we then had a manual water maker pump. However, if you could pump that for about three hours and you might get a pint of water. It's not, it's not the same as uh, an electronic <laughs> desal. And then on top of that, we then had about 60 litres of, uh, of water from, from um, town water, basically, that we could drink if we needed to, which is in the, the bowels of the boat, if you like. So, you know, every, every kind of risk that you think is going to be there, you try and put something in place and you try and have a backup for that as well because right. there isn't, you're not calling anyone to help you. No. You're out there. <laughs> There's no delivery. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's no delivery and you're relying on each other throughout the whole trip. So I, I think that's what makes it quite a beautiful thing. Yeah. And uh, you really, yeah, you've really got to just kind of muck in and, and do your time on the oars and do your time on the boat prep and get yourself prepared. But, um, you know, the, 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 the more the more risk that we encountered, like the biggest stuff, everyone thinks, ah, oh, drowning and oh, it's going to be like really like rocky and seasick. Actually, the biggest things that we faced is like the cold, you know, which you can face anywhere in the world, right? Yeah. And them sort of things are very hard to, to mitigate, especially when you're in the Middle East. You know, we had gone from 45 degrees to Norway, Tromso, which I think on the day I arrived, it was about 15 degrees. It was quite a nice day. But the further north we got, we we're into like the zeros and twos and threes degrees, you know? Mm. So trying to mitigate that was probably one of the most challenging things. But we did that locally. We actually took our rowing ergs into Ski Dubai. And we did uh, we did four hours in Ski Dubai, actually. Really? Yeah. They, kudos to Ski Dubai. That's not the first people that I've heard that have been preparing for a a colder expedition that have asked to train in there and they seem to be super accommodating yeah so. they were great they yeah. they even let it snow on us one day and they they no. yeah so they made it snow while we were rowing one day no so they were really good they were it was cool to test all the equipment out um it's yeah. like i i bought in obviously the fowls yeah. just yeah. to show you the jackets we we're wearing but you know you can imagine uh you know the, the, the risks is one thing mitigating that i think um in in your mind if you're quite mentally stable and you know you know what you're up against yeah. and no one else has put you there. I think I mentioned to you before yeah. that um, Orla had been asked in an interview before we'd even left, actually, uh, you know, how are you preparing mentally and how are you going to deal with the situation? And one of the points she raised was very much like no one else has put us there. We put ourselves there. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're in, you know, there's no one to blame. You're out yeah. there by yourself. You know, you've chose to be on that boat in them elements. So the days when you're really down, it's your own fault for being there. So you just, if anything, it makes you dig so deeper, true. you know? You yeah. can't just bail out the easy way. How did Lauren feel about it, your wife? Um, I was, to be honest, like, I had mentioned to her before, uh, before I had really 100% committed that I needed to do something. Yeah. Because I feel... Um, I feel I'd, I achieved quite a lot in my life, you know, mm. from where I started to where I am and uh, even in my work life, you know, where I've got to in a very niche industry um, and even having the beautiful kids that we've got and this lovely family. But, you know, I don't know, I think you always feel that you need to do something else, you know, and I think in the group of friends that I've got, we're all quite, you know, we're keen people. We want to do yeah. things. Um, and Lauren's very driven, you know, she wants to achieve things and do things. So 
I think she definitely understood that I needed to do something and the support was amazing. I mean, she had to single parent for a whole month <laughs> by herself, for, you know, travel in and out of Scotland for Dubai as well. Um, Whilst so not really having any communi- or much communication with you, I guess. Very little communication. Yeah. I think I spoke to her twice in 16 days. Wow. So the comms on that, we had sat phones on the boat. But it's not like you can just pick up Instagram or WhatsApp. There's no, none of that communication. And even if you send a text message by sat phone, you get it. I think it's like maybe 100, 100 texts or something. Yeah, like old school. Yeah, it's, and it, you're pressing the button three times to get to the letter you want. So obviously me and Toby, when I'm almost 40, Toby's already broken 40. So Orla's the youngest one. So she was a lot better with the texting. So we left that to Orla. So she was there texting away. Um, but yeah, so the comms were... Orla would communicate to uh, her partner. It would go on the group and Lauren was on that group and a couple of our key people on the group. So they were getting like dribs and drabs information. But it was challenging for Lauren when the girls would say, where's daddy? And yeah. Lauren would open the, the tracker that we had, the yellow brick tracker. And she would, uh, she would open that and kind of point, there, there they are, they're on their own bike. I can't really yeah. tell you anything else. It's so, tough that, tracker's always tough in longer races when it stops working or loses the GPS or in your case, which I'm sure we'll get to where you had to sit still for, for some time. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's all people have. And it's like, they're not moving. Yeah. What's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, the GPS has dropped out. Yeah. Or, yeah it's well, uh, interesting. You set the GPS up there. So th- there's something in navigation, especially satellite navigation, where the more satellites you have on your system, the more accurate your location will be. Right. We actually had one morning, um, I was adamant, the GPS was telling us we're about 10 nautical miles off the coast of, uh, of Svalbard. And when we actually, the fog had cleared, we're about 50 nautical miles offshore. Like the wow. Svalbard was a little dot on the horizon. We definitely were not 10 nautical miles. So we had, for a lot of the trip, we were basing our position on satellite navigation, which was, even when I look at the yellow brick tracker now, the yellow brick tracker shows actually where we were. Whereas our, our GPS at the time was like, that's not saying where we were. Yeah. <laughs> we were, yeah. It was saying we were a lot closer into the shore than we were. Freezing and, cold, yeah. fog, and not really knowing where we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go a little bit to the team, Andy, because obviously... Being in those situations, the, the boats are pretty small. You're, you've mentioned it, you're, you're fatigued, you're sleeping about an hour. You're really relying on, on other people. How did you guys approach that as a, as a three? Did you sort of go through expectations like how are we going to communicate or did you just wing the whole thing? So normally on, uh, on a ship or anything, it, it flies in the sky. Anything that ends up its own little ecosystem, you normally have a hierarchy of command, right? So you'll have a captain of the plane, you have a captain of the ship, yeah. space stations, you have the head astronaut, you know, you, you kind of have that and it happens in businesses, right? Course, you know? yeah. so, so for us, it was a little bit great at times, uh, you know, cause Toby's the, uh, the project's manager, it's his project, it's his thing, you know? And, uh, but I think the actual capacity navigation things like that that was my strong point right you know all uh, her capacity to dig deep and deliver like I, i've never met someone like it like there was times when i was falling asleep at the oars and she was like go to bed like you know get 15 minutes and she would cover me for an extra 15 so wow. yeah i think the it just started to kind of fall into place like we all ended up with the we didn't say okay this is your responsibility this is your responsibility this is yours because at any given point you could be the only person up on the oars uh, yeah. you know but it kind of fell in that I end up being navigation and earlier on obviously understanding the route and planning the route um, looking into a little bit more the safety aspects and things like that uh, obviously the hours I've had on boats anyway you know making sure you're shackled on life jackets mm. <clears throat> I kind of took a little bit of a, a point of dealing with the safety aspects. Um, Toby having the overall project plan, everything, you know, he basically had the whole, uh, the whole project under him, all of the uh, photography as well and all of them aspects was, was very much him. And all uh, definitely when it came to food and uh, fitness, like she very much took that on board and, and yeah. ran with it. But, um, but yeah, as a hierarchy on board, I mean, you're on the boat for a few hours a day yourself rowing. No one's telling you where to go. It's just, oh, Andy said, stick to that compass bearing. So you stick to the compass bearing. Um, but it got, it got very challenging. The first, the first rotor, we were supposed to have two up in the daytime. You, you rotor throughout the day. Everyone rows for about two hours and you have one hour off. You row about 12 hours a day. So you do 12 gym workouts a day. You know, it's quite a feat. Beautiful. Um, so 6,000 odd calories a day burnt. Um, 
And then in the evening, you would change the shift pattern, obviously, so you try and get them four hours. But we lost helm halfway. So by about day five, we lost our auto tiller. So you couldn't actually just be one person on the deck because you wouldn't be able to control the boat. Right. There is a foot steer yeah. that you have. Yeah. But the problem was in big waves or side swell, that thing's completely useless. You can't, you can't adjust it enough to correct the boat. Yeah. So... Yeah, so we ended up, uh, for a lot of the row, having two up on deck the whole time. So one person steering, one person rowing, which then throws the rotor yeah, completely so the, the out of place. the that you had, the plan that you had, just <coughs> completely gone. the window. Yeah, and that was by about day five, day six. I think the rotor was just a thing of the past. And it was basically trying to keep two people on the oars as long as possible until some, <laughs> until you couldn't take it anymore, really. Um, yeah, and did we continued do, that for 16 days. Obviously, you did a lot of training, but did you train that sort of pattern and that sleep deprivation in, in any way at all? Um, no, we, uh, for, for that we didn't, but everyone was really trying to put the hours onto the rowing ergs before we left. Everyone was dedicated. We were even kind of sharing our hours on our WhatsApp. How much right. have you done? Yeah. You know, and everyone was, uh, everyone was dedicated to the end result. You know, we wanted yeah. to, we, we didn't want to get out there and be the one who was too weak. I, I put a lot more training in at the start and got myself to a capacity where I thought I needed to be. And I don't know if I've got a bit of a hero complex or what, but it was more like I wanted to make sure that I was strong enough that it would never be me who yeah. couldn't give all, you know, if, if something happened to the team, I wanted to be able to be the one who can continue going. Yeah. So I, I put a lot of hours in and it, there's a lot you've got to you've got to try and get used to, you know, sitting on a rowing erg in a gym is one thing watching the world go by, but when you're thinking the, the waves are rocking and you're trying to eat, you're trying to drink, you're trying to prep, when are you going to get your next uh, water maker done? So, yeah, so it's all, um, yeah, so it's a random sort of scenario. Do you guys train a lot? Does Toby bring the boat back to Dubai? Did you get to train on the boat? We had done about two four-hour sessions on the boat before we rowed. And that I'd never it. slept on the boat. Ola had never slept on the boat. So, but it was the same boat that Tony uh, Toby had rowed across the Atlantic yeah. in basically eighteen months ago. Yeah, saying. yeah. exactly. Yeah, so I think he had. I, I believe it was forty-two days he had spent on the boat rush, rowing the Atlantic beforehand, um, and all had obviously done the Sausalito trip sixty odd days. So they'd both, you know, they're both rowed a fair amount. They both slept mm. on slept on the rowing boats, and uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean the. The hierarchy and the setup, it was very, you know, I had the stern cabin, Orla and Toby had the bow cabin. The only time you'd ever end up with two in there is when we're on storm anchor, you know. And But apart from that, it was pretty much one person rowing. And yeah, so it kind of worked all right. Uh, it, yeah. You know, it's it's it, you're sleeping on a gym mat. Any Anywhere you can get your head down kind of helps, right? So Comfortable? Um, <laughs> you're too tired to care about comfort, you yeah. know. You just want to, you just want to sleep. As soon as you're off the oars, you don't even want to eat. Really? You know, you're too tired to was eat. Was that hard eating? It was, and we were using, uh, I mean, the food's great. There's this uh, brand real termat. It's fantastic yeah. food. It's like dehydrated. Not the red bags. There's loads of different colors, yeah. yeah. So there's chili con carnes yeah, and chilies yeah. and all yeah. sorts, curries and pastas. And you basically pour hot water into it, leave it for eight minutes, yeah. and it rehydrates, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's eight minutes plus the preparation out of your sleep time. <laughs> So I was more uh, I was more inclined just to grab my snack packs. So on rowing boats, you're, you're burning over six thousand calories a day. Yes. So you have really calorie rich food, but you also go for muffins, Haribo's, chocolates, you know, and you have them pre wrapped. So Orla was like a diamond at this. So she was like she didn't stop talking about snack packs right up to the start really? of the race. And I'm thinking, oh come on, what's this girl on snack pack, snack pack? And literally, she helped me prep all of these, and they became the the go to thing. Yeah. You know, you put some nuts in there, some dried fruits, and literally, it was easier to grab that and consume that than trying to make a real termite meal up. Yeah. So I lost eight kilos. I mean, I Did packed you? it right back on now. Yeah, because I, <laughs> the I've refeed. eaten. And, yeah, I've eaten burgers, pizzas. <laughs> I've just gone crazy since I've been back. But uh, yeah, eight kilos in about two weeks. It's crazy. That's decent. I'm trying to think, like, there's a lot of it that you have the mindset to overcome. But there must have been some points where there was fear or, like, because fatigue changes a lot in our minds. It does, yeah. It really, like... I know you're tough. I understand that, that you know, all, all of these properties that there's, there would be no three better people that I'd want to go on that boat with. Like, it's great because you're well prepared. But when you're 
rowing for hours, going nowhere. So things like that, mate. Like how sleep I'm deprivation. interested. I'm sure, people are, are interested to hear. Like you've made it sound really good so far, and everyone's I, there, signing up. There, there was no. There was days. Um, even a hardened sailor, you know is nervous right yeah and you wouldn't be human if you tried to mask that and we had days there was one day in particular where too much information clouds your judgment and we were given information by two separate weather routers so people who were helping us trying to tell us where the weather was coming from yes uh, bear in mind we're receiving this on text messages and the text messages were coming three different text messages and they might not even come all in together if someone else sent a text message yeah, you yeah. might get sections so we've got toby and all are trying to decipher what these text messages are saying bearing in mind we're all half asleep yeah. trying to row a boat we're getting told that there's storms of up to 40 nautical miles <clears throat> coming on uh, which is bringing sea states of eight meters. You know, it could easily, easily drum that up in the waters we're in. Um, sleep deprivation, you're hungry, you're freezing cold, um, and you're getting information from there. And you're also getting information from the search and rescue saying the safest place for you to be is on land, which is two days row away, at least. <laughs> and you also have another contact who's, who's been in the water for a long time telling you the location that you're very far away from, or sorry, you're, you're very close to, should be the location you need to get away from. <laughs> so so <laughs> then moments, your, your judgment is clouded because you have lots of different information. Yeah. And you have to kind of, you have to just dig deep. And there was an easy route out that day, which call search and rescue and leave the boat. Or head for a beach and beach the boat and then get search and rescue off a beach. So the, the, the final decision was we'll all stay with the boat. But uh, there was no one on the boat at that time who was 100% confident in the situation we're in. But yeah. we, yeah, we discussed that no one's going to leave the boat and everyone was fine with the decision we made. And we dug deep and went with it. But that night on Storm Anchor, as the boat got rockier and rockier, and we, we believe we got airborne off the top of a wave, because the boat's under a ton in weight. And with the wind speed, when it came up the top of the wave, everything went silent for a couple of seconds. Oh, it felt like seconds. It could have been milliseconds. But it was so silent. and You didn't hear the water running under the boat or anything. So myself and Toby believe we were potentially airborne off the top of a wave. Wow. Um, I've got videos on my phone of the rocking and the pitching, like, you know. What do you guys do, or what did you do in that scenario? You just, you stop rowing, you're just in the yeah, boat. you can't be on the deck, so you yeah. secure the deck. We use a thing called a power anchor, which is like a massive parachute, can hold about 10 tonnes of water when it's fully deployed. And you deploy that, and you have uh, two lines. One is the actual fixed line that you anchor to, and the other is a retrieval line, so that you pull it from the back end when you want to bring it back on the deck. But you've got to secure the whole boat, so you secure the oars. And this is it's a timely thing. You can't do yeah. it. it. It's not quick. And there's three of you fumbling around each other, one setting the power anchor, one tying up the oars, one securing any loose items you got on the deck. Um, all of you just wanting to be in the cabin <laughs> to get and out of the wind. Bad weather, could be dark, freezing cold. Yeah, uh, the darkness was not a massive challenge because, because of the daylight. The, the, yeah. daylight. Yeah, it, the okay. sun would set at 12 midnight and then rise again at 2 a.m. So it would only wow. be just below the horizon. So you could always see what was coming your way, which uh, sometimes is not the best situation. <laughs> You'd rather not see it. Yeah. So you could see the sky, you could see the sea state, and you know it was that was knocking on your door. So... But yeah, you had to prep the boat, and as soon as the boat was prepped, you basically you can only open the hatches when you're going through them. A big mistake a lot of rowers make is they row with the hatches open to cool the cabins. Yes, that's your air chamber. If the boat goes upside down, that's what keeps you afloat. So, so yeah, you basically you prepare the boat, you hope for the best, get in your cabin, and then you just just you, you're on a roller coaster. You get thrown around in your cabin. Like I was at the back as well, so the back of the boat's got a lot more pitch than the front. Oh. So I was getting bounced around, got airborne off the bunk a few times uh, and you're on a little thin gym mat yeah and uh, i mentioned to you earlier the uh, the temperature of the water you know where we were was around two odd degrees and uh, we have less than an inch thickness of carbon fiber between you and that water and there's no insulation there's no heater so you just got to get in your cabin i i'm quite lucky I, I never really struggle with seasickness but i didn't want to be the person that could end up with it so i took seasickness tablets the other two used patches from day one yeah. by day four or five i'd stopped taking them because i just felt that i didn't need them um and i was quite lucky i didn't get seasick even in them situations um toby we believe before we'd even left he was actually quite sick because of some town water we had drunk oh, wow. tasted a bit off um 
and Orla got very seasick at one of the points. It was more cabin fever than I think yeah. motion sickness. Is it quite claustrophobic? Yeah, very. If You're, you get claustrophobic, yeah, it's not a, it's not a big space. You yeah. can't. You, my bunk, for example, you actually have to pull your feet into. You have to kind of slide your feet down into. So the cabin, the where you row is there. The bottom of the boat is there, and your legs go down into it. Right. And you kind of you've got this space here where you've got the navigation equipment, but it's not it's not a big place it's not at a all. Big space. And the yeah. front cabin is literally just a kind of a double bunk but it's not it's, it's smaller yeah. than a single that yeah. you'd have at the house you know um, and it kind of points to an angle as well so it's, it's not at all comfortable <laughs> it's really was there not. any moments where you were genuinely quite scared um, th that day then yeah. I would say I would have been happy to not be on the boat that day really yeah and I think all three of us would have been yeah and we had we had been stuck in currents that were they were moving about five six knots we could stop rowing and the current would keep us moving as pretty much as fast as we could row the boat anyway. Oh. And at times, with the current and the waves, we'd actually end up like beam onto the wave, which is not a good position to be on, especially when their crest is mm. there. You know, you got the risk of getting turned over. And that, that day, we were ending up sideways in this current. Uh, it was like a washing machine, you know? And that was, oh. that was, we had been through that for the last like 24 hours and then we got the news about the storm coming. So that day was, that wasn't a good day to, to exist rough, on a rowing boat. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But then we managed to get, you know, after that, um, you know, sight of land always makes you feel very different. Yeah. You know that it's not that far away. It's still a, you know, a day and a half of rowing, <laughs> but it's, it's close enough that you can get there in the event of emergency. Um, but yeah, when we got into Svalbard, that's when it all started to get a bit better and yeah, it just felt that you're, you're getting closer to somewhere, you know? <laughs> how did it, well, how does it feel putting in a lot of effort and going nowhere or going backwards? Oh, it's so degraded. Like, is it, oh, <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's horrible. Absolutely horrible. Like you, I mean, I haven't even talked about hands and blisters. Yeah. I mean, anybody who's trained in the gym, you know them days after you've done the kipping swings because yeah. you forgot your, your grips. Or, <laughs> we saw you know, it this morning, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your hands are ripped to shreds. <laughs> Your, your hands are like that every single day and after a blister has healed it blisters underneath yeah, it yeah. so your hands are ripped and every time you get on the oars um, every time you're on them oars you literally you go through pain for the first five or six movements strikes and then the pain goes away yeah. but that's generally because the blisters have opened or something you uh, know it's a bit rank but yeah you kind of just got to dig deep with that but uh, yeah I can imagine that's that's rough, like, because there's no, especially with rowing, it's your hands, there's no other option. Yeah. You just have to... You have to dig deep, and you, 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 you try on. and have gloves to keep your hands warm, that, that affects your grip, yeah. and on an erg, the actual handle's quite thin, on yeah. a rowing boat, the, it's quite a big oar, you know? So, yeah, you've got that to deal with, your back pain, I mean, your back pain's, I, I've had a bad back anyway, actually why I started training here was because I yeah, slipped cause a disc, you know, so I'm probably not the best person to end up on an ocean <laughs> so rowing boat, true. you know, and recently with the, the migraines because of my, yeah. my upper spine, so probably not the best person to jump on a rowing boat and row fit, like 16 days sat down, but, <laughs> but yeah, so the back pain is something, I still can't heal the back, feel the backs of my heels, I've lost all feeling in them, really? uh, it's not a normal thing, but it, yeah, I've ended up with it but I live with it. Um, so yeah, this. <laughs> let's go to the good stuff, mate. I also have visions or have heard and obviously seen some documentaries of just some incredible moments. Yeah. You must have had some uh, just... I think... That you you like you mentioned about sleep deprivation. Like sleep deprivation really brings you into like a low place, but you get it turned completely on end when a whale like comes up next to the boat, right? And these, these like one day we were there so tired and uh, like that day we were probably seeing about 40 whale breaches. It was insane how many whales were out there. Wow. And you look on the horizon, there's almost like this fountain of mist coming up and uh, it's just whale after whale. And yeah, there was one day this whale came up and from pretty much the front of it to its blowhole was about the same length as the boat. Wow. And we're at, that's an eight meter. <laughs> That's, that's, that's not even a third of the whale. Do you know what I mean? Like, this thing must have been massive. Um, but yeah, the, the, the beautiful things, the, the sunrises and sunsets, and they were so close together. So only two yeah. hours between, you know? And um, yeah, we had uh, puffins with us nearly the whole trip. Uh, dolphins, and like dolphins in absolute freedom, you know, jumping out, just, just having fun. 
Uh, we had a minky whale stick with us for about 30 minutes, just swimming under the boat. Wow. You know, th th they're moments that, you know, and uh, I think also the end of the trip, mm. the embrace on the dock between like the three of us that you've done it. Like you can't, you can't, you can't buy them feelings and what they'll never go like? away. It, it was, it was crazy because the last, the last section of the trip was flat water coming into Long Year Bayern. And we be, I believed it was some catabatic, which is where the colder, dense wind falls down the hillside. I believed that it was 30 knots of catabatic wind hitting us, but it wasn't. It was actually the storm that we were told if we were out there, we wouldn't have got to where we're going. <laughs> and lucky it hit us on the last minute. So we've been rowing for about 30 minutes without moving, soul destroying. We tried to, to land a few times in the harbour because the wind and the bow is so light, we're just getting blown off. And uh, the actual... The, the journey was only finished when we actually got onto land. Yeah. Do you know? Like it's, it's a crossing. So it only counts from when you get on the boat to when you vacate the boat. So yeah, we finally got tied up and then we got onto land and our legs are all over the place. Like your, your sea legs. Cause yeah, you, is it, it, it's, it's legit, right? It's great. It, <laughs> yeah. it, like two weeks after we're still occasionally wobbling, you know, bouncing off the walls wow. in the town and all sorts. It was, it was the first night's up the high sleep must've been, yeah, I'll, I'll like, tell you about that one in a minute. <laughs> yeah, okay, that is hilarious. That but the, uh, yeah, getting onto solid ground and getting all three of us off the boat and just being like, we've, we've done that. Like, yeah. we've been through moments where, you know, you can't really put it into words. No, the other not. two on the boat know what that day was like. And uh, to get through it and be there now in the destination that had been on maps, had been on charts, been on Google Earth, you know, we've read into it, we, we've heard all about it, and we're finally there. It was, it was a mesmerizing experience. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the first sleep, God, I, I had text Lauren, we had a, a bit of a gathering back at the hotel, there was loads of people coming out to see us, it was fantastic, like we didn't wow. expect this, this kind of welcome that we got in Svalbard, uh, in, in Long Year Bayern. Um, but loads of people just turned up. Loads of people from the marina who watched us came in. Loads of students wow. came just to, you know, have a chat with us. And because we've been all over the press there as well, which was amazing. And three, three silly people from Dubai. Yeah. In boat. <laughs> they made the it. They made it. And I literally, uh, I slipped away because I saw the night was getting quite late. I slipped away at about 11.30 and because all I wanted was a bath. I had had my cheeseburger and my pizza or my dinner with the team. And I was like, I just need to get a bath and lie down. And uh, I went and had a bath and I woke up at about quarter to three in the morning, still in the bath, freezing. And it's, oh, no. <laughs> and I passed out in the bath. And I literally, I text Lauren and uh, I let her know that I fell asleep in the shit She was like, brilliant one. You make it all the way across yeah, the devil's dance drowning. floor and drown in a bath. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. So it was the first night's sleep and the dreams were, because you hadn't had deep sleep yes. for, for days on end, for yeah. weeks, your mind now needs to try and put all of this into, in, in, into its memory. Mm -hmm. So all of us were waking up thinking we're still on the boat, still rowing. Orla was waking up thinking she was rowing. I'm waking up thinking I'm navigating. Mm -hmm. You know, each day we'd catch up and talk about the dreams the night before. Mm -hmm. You know, what did you, what did you dream of? And Are you still it, having them? No, that, like the last one was actually I got to Dubai. I'd been in Dubai for about two or three days and I went for a little lie down and uh, I ended up passing out for about two and a half, three hours. I was just obviously out of it and I woke up and looked out the window and I thought I was late for my plane. I didn't actually know where I was. I thought I had to fly to Dubai that day. So yeah, it just your mind just plays tricks on you, right? So. Yeah, I think I always think it takes a little bit of time to recover and to yeah. come back to... No, I guess normality or life it's it's a weird thing I mean you know Ben obviously mm. uh, started a good chat with Ben when I came back I felt very flat like and this is the mental space like very very flat because you had done something that had taken so much time like we were finishing our everyday jobs and coming home and two to three hours of our evenings were spent on whatsapps to each other we were doing trainings we were going to ski Dubai 4 35 a.m in the morning to get there early going to see survival stuff over in Jebel Ali yeah. um you know so we had gone to all of these things and we had spent hours and hours working on something and then you finally complete it which is great and then you come back and all of a sudden everything's said and done apart from now talking about the amazing trip and trying to bring the plastic awareness to the children and all that but it's kind of like you, you've been building up to this pinnacle and it's yeah. finished and you, you almost felt like you're mourning you know you're in a really weird state and it was about two weeks I was flat mm. like I didn't really know what I how I felt or anything it's hard right it's really yeah it's really strange but like I'm kind of 100% back to normal now you mm. know 
just get if anything like things are there's not enough going on in life at the moment. Do you know what I mean? A Lauren would probably say different. <laughs> but it's too much time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you think, what did it do to you? Uh, I, did it give you what you wanted? I think, um, yeah, I'd, I'd lost a friend uh, a year before, um, unfortunately. And that was always playing in my mind. Uh, it, unfortunately, it was suicide and mm. mental uh, mental health of some shape or form, unfortunately. Um so yeah, so I kind of always had this thing that I wanted to do something and I had him in my mind. Actually, it was one year um, while I was away, you know, anniversary of his death, unfortunately. So I had that in my mind the whole trip. But, um, but yeah, my, for me, I kind of, I, I needed to prove something to myself, you know, and, you know, going to do something with friends, you know, I've done some cool stuff with my mates, but yeah. you're doing it as a group, you know, I wanted to kind of prove something to myself and, you know, even in the preparation, the build-up to it, you know, can I do this? And I think it was very fulfilling to complete it. Yeah. And, you know, I've got that. And there's only, we believe, there's only 11 people who have done this. So out of the 9 billion people in the world, we're a very elite club. Yeah. And, and no one's done it, we believe, in a trio. We believe that there was a, a team of six and a team of two. So, yeah, we're... we're we believe that we're, you know, the first to do this. We're waiting on confirmation on all this wow. now. So it's it's amazing to to be to have that, you know. And I'm I'm even putting a book together. I'm writing a book at the moment about wow. it, My, mainly because I don't want to forget all this stuff. Yeah, you know. And if it's written down somewhere, you know, hopefully I'll publish it one day. <laughs> but if not, it'll be something I can look back in when I'm an old man and think, yeah, I did that. That was a cool thing yeah. to achieve. And I think yeah, it's it's taught me a lot about perseverance. Um, I was talking to someone the other evening at a friend's house uh, who was in the military and we talked about sleep deprivation and there's times when you think your body's completely done and y it's amazing that you can just get the second wind I would say on a rowing boat probably third, fourth, fifth wind but yeah for 16 days yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can dig deep and find this in you and uh, I think I needed to yeah I think I need so to prove that to myself probably more self-belief now than you had? I would say um, yeah I'd say like I've, uh, there's a lot more, yeah. I mean, I've always had, I've always been quite a confident yeah, person confident, in a way. Yeah. I'm, I've never shied away from anything. Um, and I'm confident in who I am, you know. I've got a lot of, a fantastic family support, a fantastic friend network, you know. Um, even support for the, for the row, you know. We had amazing uh, sponsors and support behind us for the row. So... So yeah, even from my work as well, I had great support from my work um, for, for the actual thing. So I think, yeah, for me, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in a good place from it. And mm. uh, yeah, definitely, definitely learned a lot about myself. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see some of the things that maybe you learned or you went through? Is there transferable skills into have things like that you see in your daily life, be it in work or family life, have they become different, maybe become easier or, or change at all? I think when you're, everything seems a little bit tamer. Mm. After you've been in a really high risk situation, obviously you've mitigated them risks, but everything's quite tame. Do you know what I mean? Like everything's quite subdued. It's nothing's too much of a challenge <laughs> now, you know? Um, but yeah, and I feel like if there's anything I need to do now, I can, I'll just be able to get on and do it. it. I don't think there's anything going to be quite as challenging as you know the only other sleep deprivation that i could put close and it didn't even come close to this is becoming a father for the first time like yeah. you know there's two weeks of you know the stories that you get becoming a dad like sleep deprivation but uh yeah this this i mean that doesn't even come close to how tired i was on that boat yeah um and i had to dig deep and still row so it's funny so i think sometimes just simple stuff like when you're queuing up for waitros and everyone's just going nuts and people are on the horn in the car park. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's just insanity anyway, isn't it? Because they're beeping at someone who's trying to put their groceries in the car to leave. But often when I come back from a trip, I'm often like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, this is What so is the world we live like, in? Yeah. Yeah. You, you like, and, and you were in a more extreme scenario. Than I've been in 10 times worse, yeah. mate. Like, in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's, it's crazy in the ocean. I, I can just imagine, like, it's just like... You know, it oh was amazing God. out there just being us. Mm. Us, the sea, 
whatever Mother Nature was going to throw at us, it was just us and Mother Nature. There wasn't, you know, there was no one honking their horn, no yeah. one pushing you saying you need this done by now. You know, there is no work projects on your mind. You're, you're literally rowing, resting and keeping yourself alive and taking care of the team who's with you. That's pretty cool. You know, so it's, you're completely... You're disconnected from everything. There's no, oh, I'm going to jump on Facebook or yeah. Instagram or, you Did know. Did you struggle with that at all? The Did you struggle with, like, completely only being, or only having to focus on those things and no connection from the outside world? You know, not, not at all. It was, it was something I think, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a loner by any means. I love socialising with people. Yeah. But I'm also very comfortable in my own space. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so yeah. it was quite nice actually having that time by yeah. yourself and zoning out. You know, my life's been pretty full on for, for <laughs> a fair few years now. So to, to kind of take a bit of a step back and, you know, reconnect with everything. Yeah. Did you, and you don't have to say what they are if you did, but did you have any realisations because if you had that space and no distractions and obviously a lot of time just rowing like this and looking, did you have any sort of moments where you thought, actually, I'm going to change that in my life? Or So, yeah, I think for me, fitness is something, it was only like two years ago that I started here. Yes. And I, it's actually something I'm writing at the moment about in, in this book I'm putting together. I'm, uh, it's actually going into, the, at a certain point, I thought I was still fit and healthy. And it was only when I came here a couple of years ago and started training that I realized I'm really not as fit and healthy as I once was. You know, <laughs> the assault <laughs> bike, I hate that thing. <laughs> Rowing, pull-ups, like, you know, I'd easily knock out 25 to 30 pull-ups when I used to climb. Yeah. But that was when I was 17. You know, in the back of my head, I still think I'm 17, but my body's saying <laughs> you're not. So I think, like, that's something that the fitness, I really, uh, yeah, it's kind of resonated. I really enjoyed the training up to it. And I think that's something I'll, I'll be back here obviously next month. I'll be mm. kicking it off again and getting on with the CrossFit stuff. But I think that's uh, that's something. And I will I will definitely say the the feelings leaving the children and leaving Lauren at the airport T three, not really knowing what the destiny was going to be, despite having it all planned and lots of risk mitigated, saying goodbye to the family. This actual this bracelet. This is what the girls gave me. It's, oh, no it's way. supposed to keep you safe, right? So I've, I've worn it the whole trip. I haven't taken it off yet. I'm not going to tempt fate. Um, <laughs> but that was actually, it was weird when I'd said goodbye to them and got on the plane and that was it. I wasn't going to see them until after the row. That was a weird feeling. And uh, I think if anything, it's made me, I, I wouldn't say I never didn't love them to bits, but yeah. it's kind of made me a lot more, you know, yeah. I think about the girls all the time because yeah. of it, you know. And out there, um, it's weird, you... you you miss people on a daily basis when you don't see them. But when you're that far away from friends and family, like you do, you take it for granted, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and I'd say that's something that I really, yeah, I can't wait. The weather's perfect. And I can't wait to get back surfing with the girls and bike yeah. riding and do all the yeah. fun stuff, you know, so we can make all their memories. But that's something I'd say I really, uh, yeah. 100% I'll be dedicating a lot more time to. That's cool. You know, That's very cool. Yeah. I guess my final question then, which is, Something that sometimes I don't like to ask, but maybe I should ask is, what comes next? Is yeah. there a next? I, I'd like, uh, I mean, if it wasn't, I, I was talking to someone, we were out the other evening and I was talking to someone and I kind of put it down, it's quite a selfish thing. If I asked Lauren, it would probably be a very selfish thing. It's a, it's a selfish thing to dedicate that much time to something for yourself, but it's also in some respects, something that you need to sometimes find that time to do it for yourself. Because if you don't, you're living just for other people, which isn't really, I believe, what we're here for, you know? Yeah. You need to have that for yourself. So if it didn't take so much time and commitment away from prime years of the children's life, I'd probably jump on a rowing boat tomorrow. Wow. I would love to do something else. But as a dedication to family and being the dad that I want to be, I don't think I'll do another one, but I'll definitely be supporting the Arabian Ocean Rowing team as much as I can because there's other great big things coming. Like, yeah. this isn't the only, uh, you know, I think... It's Dave, such a great fit for you, mate. It's great. And, yeah. like, having the marina at our disposal with me running it there with the with the amazing team and, uh, you know, if we've got to use that as as a gateway to get people out onto the rowing boat, 
to to get the kids out onto the sea to get you know some gender equality awareness in the a bit more into the culture here and yeah. you know really kind of you know push a few more boundaries yeah. then yeah i think uh yeah i mean that's a great journey to be on yeah. and even as a bit of a passion project on the side doesn't yeah. have to become your day job but to support and know that you're doing something which has got a lot more meaning yeah like getting in front of the schools and talking to all the students at the end of every talk we've done the amount of hands that come up to ask questions it's it's crazy everyone wants to ask a question and even the teachers are telling us they've never seen so much like response from the kids there's so much you know when they start they think oh what's all this about you know or some guys rowing and at the end of it they all want to know who yeah can we ask you this question what's this what's the biggest fish you sort of like so you know knowing that that's potentially making a difference Mm. and out of that that room of kids um two or three of them hopefully will not use single-use plastics again. We'll be aware of the plastic situation more than they hopefully are in, in the generation today. They'll hopefully go home and someone might have said, oh, don't do that, oh, you can't do that, and they'll prove them wrong, you know, because, you know, th- that's part of the, yeah. you know, so the, the story behind more it. being able to create more impact, but also not sacrificing these golden years with with the girls yeah. at, at the moment but you're involved in something that gives you purpose and 100%. helps you to have an impact because i mean we barely talked about the the, the clean seas stuff as well because that's that's a whole other huge side there's, in itself, i mean yeah there's it? huge i mean it'd be wrong of me not to mention but yeah, yeah. so you know the united nations is something that had, uh, toby had linked with when he was doing his uh, the ocean run and everything and the plastic pollution, you know, the, the plastic pledge now, it's a serious issue, you know, and it's getting into our food streams. Like, so it's, it's not a good position to be in. Yeah, and in. every day we pass plastic up there. We pass plastic. Really? We've got some of it on the boat that's coming back. Um, Toby's going to make some into some little prizes and stuff for some of the uh, stuff he's doing with the schools. Um, but yeah, we, we, we had pollution out there, even just in the harbour, you know, plastic bottle caps that we've, we've scooped out. Um, yeah, and then the, the gender equality is a huge thing. Obviously, being a father with two children, Toby's got a daughter as well as a son. Um, you know, th- they think Ola's amazing. And my, my children are like, oh, when are we going to see Ola again? And I think an amazing, uh, amazing feat for her, we believe as well, that she's the first uh, female to ever row that Barents Sea and the first female ever to row fr- north to south from Tromso up to Svalbard. So, yeah, I mean, that's an amazing feat for her. And one hell of a story, you know. Yeah. So, you know, having the girls, that kind of fits with my everyday life of gender equality. You know, yeah. I, d- I don't want them to grow up in a world where a guy thinks they're better than, like, no, no, way. no the, way. I mean, no one will be able to tell the youngest one that anyway. She'll, she'll have them <laughs> she'll straight out. Them straight. <laughs> she'll sort them straight out. You know, the eldest is a bit more tame and calm, bless her. But, um, but yeah, you know, the gender equality is the main thing. The plastic pledge, that, that really fits in with my everyday life. Yeah, the sea is my beautiful. ecosystem. It's yeah. my economy. It's everything, right? Yeah. So if we can help protect protect it um and then inspiring the children i mean you know hopefully we'll end up in my kids school soon you know and we'll be able to talk to all them they 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 keep on saying daddy when are you coming to our school so i'm on it to toby come on when are we going to go to their school (laughs) yeah amazing mate congratulations and thank you so much for your time it's a great story wow and it was great to, to watch you train and, and to go and get after it. So yeah, Thanks, appreciate it. And all support from the guys here as well. Uh, everyone was amazing. The, I think I watched one day, there was about three or four CrossFit classes came through while I was on the rower. <laughs> That's how long I was sat on it. And that was Mesmer, just sat there rowing. There's one class, they're finished. The next one comes out, warm up and then the wad, you know. I was like, brilliant. Yeah. It's so good. Andy, thank you so much, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers, thanks, Max. Thanks.